Good morning in Miami and welcome to uh, Small Talk. Um, before we begin our conversation, I'd like to thank um, ArtBridges for the generous support of this program. And today, so this program is, is really conceived to have informal chats with artists, mainly in the Bass Collection, and just check in to see what they're working on and what they've worked on in the past. Um, also, feel free to um, write any questions in the chat or send them in because we'll take them up either at the end or if we want to in the middle of our chat, informal conversation. So let's go. So today I have, um, I'm delighted to, in, to welcome Susan Phillips, who's a Scottish artist, mainly um, known for her sound installations, but is also a sculptor. Um, she is the Turner Prize winner in 2010. And it's um, very interesting, the first time ever that a sound work of art um, won the Turner Award. So that's very interesting. Of course, she's shown all over the world and is in collections everywhere, including the Louisiana Museum, the Wexner Manifesta Munster Sculpture Project, the Pulitzer, and now the Bass. Um, welcome, Susan. How are you? Oh, great. Nice to be with you today. Absolutely, and you're joining us um, from Berlin. That's right. Um, in Berlin, uh, we're six o'clock here in the evening. Yeah. So maybe I should say good morning and good evening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, you know, I did mention um, the Turner Prize, and it was a bit a while ago. So why don't we begin kind of at that year, and you talk to us a little bit about Surround Me, um, which you produce with Art Angel. Yeah, that's right, because it was in the same year. The Turner Prize and the Art Angel Project were both in 2010. And I was asked by Art Angel, they commissioned Art and Public Space in London, if I would consider making work for them. And I was absolutely thrilled because, you know, I'd heard so much about them as an organization and and so I went to London with fresh eyes looking for a place and I went at the weekend and I went into the city center which is the financial district and I was struck by how eerily silent it was it was a bit like like now because of the lockdown and everything like the streets are really quiet and that's how it was then because it was the weekend and the financial district basically closes down at the weekend. So I thought this is a fantastic uh, place for me to make some sound installations in. So um, yeah, so, but it was uncanny. The feeling was uncanny. And I, I noticed um, because like the, the financial district had formerly been a, a medieval walled city and so there's lots of traces still there of that. And also in the names of the streets and everything. So I started doing a bit of research into that period. And that's where I, I um, discovered all these incredible um, madrigals and, and, and more about the, what it was like then for, uh, I mean, the, the, the voice, the, the human voice was really prevalent back in the early modern city because you didn't have cars and you didn't have machinery sounds. So the voice was the dominant sound that you heard in the streets. And it, it wasn't any wonder that the composers of the time were, were inspired by what they heard in the streets, like from the street traders. So the street traders would, they would be in competition with one another to be heard. So they had to sort of find a ways to, to um, you know, have their own particular sound or um, it was almost sounded like a bit of a call and response. They would have their own sort of tones and things they would use. So, the, so you know, people like John Dowland and, and uh, Thomas Tomkin, and, uh, and uh, they were really enthused by these street traders' cries. So it wasn't just the madrigals that, the they were that were it was also the 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 low the, the 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 sounds of the street traders that were that was particularly interesting for me when I did the research. Oh, that sun's blinding. It's nice. <laughs> so, yeah, so so that's what brought me to the magical. You know, I hadn't um so to, I, I sort of started to work with the magical for 
for the Art Angel project. Um, I did six interrelated sound installations throughout the city, and it was um, we uh, and um, it was. Um, so I started thinking about these themes of fluidity and circulation and immersion, and I noticed that there was a lot of throughout the there was this, a recurring theme that seemed to run throughout a lot of these songs that I was discovering, and these these themes of of those themes those themes of water, you know, and and tears. Um, so this this was fascinating me that it, you know every other song seemed to be dealing with those themes. So, um, you know what I think we should do? Do you have a video clip of the of the work? Yes, I do. Um, the... I think it's important for us to play it early on before we continue talking, so that people... yeah, yeah, let's do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's, so we could we could watch um, "Weep on My Eyes," the the magical I did for that I worked with for Art Angel. Yeah, in the Excellent. Murphy. I think so because that way I think it becomes like a group conversation and not just you know something that you and I have you know looked at before in the past. So let's let's play that and then continue with you know, our conversation. Yeah, let's do that. back on now. So thank you um, for playing that. Um, for those of you, I just going to give a little bit of a description. Susan uses her voice, which is untrained, correct? Yes, that's correct. <laughs> Maybe by right now you're trained. Um, but you know, that allows for, you know, certain imperfections and breathing and all of that, that oftentimes you don't see in these recordings and you overlap them doing a lot of research in 16th century and other historic, but also a great variety. I think using, um, I read Nirvana and David Bowie as well as, as source material. So it's, it's your voice and almost, the, the, so the sound is music, but it's your voice. And it goes back to what you were talking about where the voice had such an important role. Talk to us about that and about this early work. 
Yeah, well, that's right. So back then, the voice was really present in, in the city, and I became really fascinated by that. And I uncovered all of these incredible um, this material. And one of them was what you just heard, this magical um, by John Bennett called We Pour Mine Eyes. And it was the, the Elizabethan um, era, and it was known as the, the melancholy era. And I, as I said, the, it was almost like fashionable to be melancholic. It was, you know, the, all the many songs were written about, you know, unrequited love and tears and, and Shakespeare wrote about it. Um, uh, Queen Elizabeth, uh, heart not in the, uh, that, that, that has passed. I will, I will harp on that string till my heart strings break with, with love. So, so this was the Elizabethan era. The, the, and there was a book as well by Burton, Richard Burton, called The Anatomy of Melancholy. And so it was really the, the time of melancholy. And so, so that, that magical, I, I found, I wasn't really familiar with magicals until then. And I, I read that magicals were designed to, for the, when the voices overla overlap, it gave the illusion that you didn't need to draw breath. So I thought that was interesting. Mm. And breath has been something that has be, so become um, a metaphor in, 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 in other works, you know, breath being a, a metaphor for life and, and mortality. Um, yeah, so that's more, I suppose, in war damaged musical instruments that maybe we could talk about a bit later. Yes, definitely. I just wrote down those things that you're saying because they're so beautiful that I, you know, I, I got lost in writing down these notes because I just kind of want to keep them to, with me and think about them um, a little bit. Yes, definitely. Let's talk about war damaged musical instruments. So that was in 2007 in the Hamburger Bandhof. Mm, no, it was later than that. It was um, to, um, um, gosh, when was it? No, no, 2017. I misspoke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. let's listen to that a little bit. I noticed when I was going through it, it has no voice. That's right. It's more about the breath. Yeah, yeah. Let's listen to that as a contrast. Okay. Thank you. 
went off script. So we're flexible, you know. <laughs> Our tech um, had planned, um, oh, sorry, you're muted. Our, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think we did say we would play that after. So that was, a, I think it was my fault for starting to talk about war damaged musical instruments. So we did actually say we'd talk about this, that magical because that led me to Too Much I Once Lamented, which I think is such a beautiful magical. Um, again, dealing with those same themes of immersion and fluidity and, and um, tears. And this one is about unrequited love, you know, it's... And when I first heard that, I thought, oh, it sounds really almost like new music, really avant-garde certain parts of it, you know? And, I, you know, just really, um, I just loved that. If it was for five voices. But I, but again, because it was dealing with these uh, themes of water, I, I felt it was would be a good, perfect for the, the water feature. Definitely. And so the, the video that we saw was at the Pulitzer, correct? That's right, that's right. It was, um, so you see the, the, the speakers, and I wanted to ask you about that because I've noticed that some sound artists want the speakers to disappear and just have the sound sort of like air, but you like to bring out the machinery. You like to bring out the speakers and show them very much like a sculptor. So can you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I often work with horn speakers, which do have a very sculptural uh, quality about them. And th those are the speakers that I worked with for War Damaged Musical Instruments that we'll have a look at soon. But um, yeah, so I think, um, but as when you say sculpture, I suppose it's in the sound itself becomes sculptural, you know, it's sort of how- Absolutely. Yeah, and how you're sort of immersed in the sound and how it can define the space. And so in that sense, it's um, it's sculptural, I guess. Definitely, definitely sculptural. Um, so we're so excited and we're honored and just delighted that we acquired the work. The Bass acquired the work um, earlier on. Was it, I'm losing track of time. Was it last year, late last year? I believe so. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And we have some pictures of it in case um, somebody in Miami wants to go and visit it. We're going to show some pictures just now of where it is and also installed in water. So we see it right there. Um, the pictures of the pond sort of between the ballet and our education center. And if you can see the speakers that are that you can see very large speakers that are installed around the pond. Um, and so um, we sort of thought that when we were starting, you know, with the whole pandemic and COVID, the work was such a marker of this time, the loneliness and a lot of people were isolated and, you know, it brought up questions about getting together. And so we thought that as sort of a legacy of the time to have this mark, this time in history, do you have any thoughts about this work in particular and what we're living now globally? Well, I think it's, um, as you say, it's, it's a, a sort of um, sad, sad time for many people. And the, the song is a, a lamentation um, and being forlorn. And um, so, you know, I suppose that kind of resonates for, for that reason. Um, yeah, and it's like I say, when I first came, started to think about the magical, it was when I visited the city of London when there was no people there. It was really mm -hmm. strange, you know, so I suppose that that did inspire the work and it was almost like a, you know, I mean, it, it, like it is now with the, you know, the lockdown. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely so. And you know, when we decided to install it outside, we had all of those themes, isolation and loneliness and sadness and everything. But just having the work outside and people encountering it has brought some joy and a little bit of comfort because they're mm -hmm. encountering a work of art. So mm -hmm. it's what we've seen sort of 
um, dual reactions to it, surprise and joy of finding something. Oh, that's nice to hear. Because I think it's as well, people might be quite um, disarmed by hearing sound suddenly, you know, they yeah. might come across it unexpectedly. And then, and then at that moment, you become aware of your environment and your surroundings and the architecture and you might encounter the same place that you street you walk down all the time, it becomes somehow changed, you know, and I, I enjoy that by working in public space, you know, that you can yeah, and, and if you see this image here, you do see the uh, sort of back and side of the building. So we're standing in this image as if we were across the street in the ballet, the Miami City Ballet, looking at the museum. But when you look at it, it's a very urban environment as well. And so this encounter in with the work of art, it's very unexpected in this urban environment. And it does compete with you know, cars and um, construction and then that. So that even makes it a little more uncanny. Mm. Yeah, well, it looks beautiful. I mean, the, the water court, it looks beautiful. Yeah, I'd love to come and see it there. It's, it's, a, it's such a shame I couldn't be there to experience it myself, but from, I can imagine it, yeah. Well, you're very welcome to come as soon as we can get you here. You know, it does remind me because we have a relationship from the past in um, what year was it, 2010 or nine or no? Well, I, I think, you know, I, I don't remember, but we did show my work um, by my side of 2009. Um, we did, we showed it as part of um, also an outdoor exhibition, which we sort of traditionally done at the Bass because we have this wonderful urban and park environment. And, um, and so that was the work that you selected for us, I remember, because we sort of started a conversation. I love all the work, but what would you propose? Why did you propose that work? Well, I like the horizon line, you know, when you looked out into the ocean, you could see the horizon. So that, that chimed with the, the words of the, the from this um, by my side, you know. So yeah, I think it, it it did resonate there, and also working with the two sides of the space, you know, because it's a two-channel work, um, like a duet, and it, and I think it it, it was just a, a really great location for for that work and this vista. Um, yeah, and I did see that installed and I was very happy with how that, that worked there. Yeah. Yes, yes. And I think I told you a little bit, but I'll tell um, everyone else about an anecdote that we had with the New World Symphony. So um, back then, the dorm <laughs> of the New World Symphony, and for those of you who don't know, it's, um, it's an orchestral academy, a very famous one that we have in um, Miami Beach. So the dorms were there and the students, um, they made an appointment with the museum and they wanted to very seriously talk to me because the sound work was getting in the way of their practice. Um, actually, they're practicing their instruments in their dorm when they got back after school. So um, it was a really interesting negotiation with people and surroundings. And you know, it started out kind of that way where we negotiated a you know, volume level that was acceptable to the artist, but at the same time that they could deal with, but also mainly we negotiated um, hours. So you know, I think after five o'clock after the museum closed, they were closed. So then two weeks later, I get another visit from the students and they said, well, we just, the volume is just, we cannot deal with this work of art. I said, well, for two weeks, we haven't been playing it after the agreed upon time. And the response from sort of the leader was, well, it's just, I can't get it out of my head. Mm -hmm. And I remember my response, sort of, <laughs> I, I tried not to laugh, but I think I laughed a little bit. And I said, well, that's fine. I can't do anything about it. <laughs> Said an earworm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. it's, it's funny because sometimes like the work that I installed in Governor's Island in New York, Sometimes I thought I was hearing the work when it wasn't on, you know, because you hear it in the ship's horns or the thing, you know, other other sounds that you think, is that is that it on? But it, no, it can be on. That's not when it's supposed to be on. So yeah. that's not the first time that's happened. It's happened to me a few times. 
Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think we can jump to wartime, the war damaged musical instruments of 2017 shown at the Hamburger Bahnhof. And again, I'll repeat, it has no voices. It has sounds. Yeah, it's that's right. It was actually shown in was shown in Hamburg Bahnhof, but I think the footage we have is from the Tate um, Britain in the oh, Davine yeah. galleries. Yeah, because uh, I've shown different um, constellations of, of the spark in this, but that was the biggest one with all sixteen mm. uh, horn speakers. Sixteen. Sixteen. Yeah, so would you like me to say something about that now or should we watch the video first? Let's watch the video so everyone can oh. enjoy your comments. Sylvia, you were right. It, that was Hamburger Bahnhof. I'm sorry, not the team. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but you asked about it being um, not my voice, but it was using yeah. breath. I mean, I became fascinated by these um, war damaged musical instruments that were in a vitrine in, here in Berlin in this um, musical instrument uh, museum. And they were really badly damaged. And so I, I'd sort of thought about what would happen if you tried to produce sound with these instruments, or could they produce any sound? Mm -hmm. And um, so that, that set me off on this journey, discovering all these incredible instruments, not only in Germany, but also in, in, in the UK. And uh, we recorded, in the end, 16 altogether. And some of them were from, had this, these incredible histories, like one was from the, the Battle of Waterloo. Another was from the, the Charge of the Light Brigade, a, a balaclava bugle from the Charge of the Light Brigade. And we knew so much about the person who, who, who led the charge with the bugle and a boy called Billy Britton. And he was, he was um, a, a Cossack tried to take it and he lanced it with the sword. And it has a gash in the, in the bugle. And then he's taken to be nursed by Florence Nightingale. And but he dies. But this incredible story lives on. And, and so I was able to work with that. And 
It was, um, so, so yeah, and some of them didn't have any stories that we knew, only that there was a bullet hole through it, it, that came from the, you know, the First World War or, or um, but some lots of different wars from different periods of time. But I had but just- Histories, even if you don't know them, each one of those were histories. They sort of had their history embedded in them, which is- That's right. Which is really beautiful. So, mm -hmm. To, to finalize the last the last um, video before we take collections, um, we're going to show um, Sleep Close and Fast, Rosemary's Baby. Is that, um, Susan, is that the last work you've made? Um, mm, no, it's a very recent work, but I'm working on some different works at the moment. I have a show opening at the end of the, the month in the Corner Fisher Gallery. Uh, and that's called Slow Fresh Fount, and um, it's, a, in a, it's uh, working with all three floors of this um, gallery, and I'm really working with the acoustics, and I was inspired by the echo. And this is something I was also interested in when I did the um, uh, Sleep Close and Fast. I, mean, I wanted to work with, I, I became really interested in objects that could create their own um, echo. You know, like when often I would um, explore when I go to a space for the first time and I want to hear the acoustics, I'll, I'll project my voice into the space to get an idea of, of the reverberation time. And I would do, you know, the way you might do if you were calling down into a well or a, under a tunnel or. Uh, so this is something that I'm, I'm interested in with sleep close and fast. And where we use these these oil barrels that have this amazing um, ability to amplify the sound, very small sound, but you put the speaker on the top and it sounds like um, a cathedral. It's huge mm -hmm. the sound. Um, so uh, yeah, so the so the, the work that I did there in uh, Los Angeles and Tanya Bernardi Gallery was um, I became really interested in these. Um, lullabies taken from from movies primarily uh that had a bit of a dark side you know so like um rosemary's baby being one of them and it's, it's it starts with this famous uh this the lullaby um and so that was i think that's the one we're going to listen to yeah uh, yeah so but there's like seven different let's hmm? take a look now yeah, and listen, um, yeah. um, later yeah. okay
That's such a beautiful lullaby. It's just beautiful. And I also want to ask you about the, the, the drums, the oil drums. They are beautiful objects. Yeah, I was really amazed at how they could create this echo, this, um, this huge space, you know, when they're such small objects and you put very little sound and they, how they, they um, echo in that way. So, yeah, that's something that I'm, I've been working more with because uh, normally, I, I mean, I work with the space and the echo of the space, but now I'm sort of making objects that also echo, they have a... They resonate, they, they have a, um, yeah, which is actually the theme of, of my, my, the show that I'm working on now, Echo, the, the mythological Echo, you know, the one who, who was destined yeah. to repeat the last um, set, um, words of the parent. That's, that's why you call Echo Echo after the mythological Echo. You know. can, you, can you share that a little bit for those who are not familiar with the mythological Echo? Echo, yeah, well, she was a she was a wood nymph, and she was a bit of a, a gossip, and um, she um, she um, was cursed by the wife of Zeus, I think. For she was trying to, he was, I think, off with some other woman, and so she was trying to distract the wife, and so then she was cursed for doing that. So she was never allowed to um, say a full sentence. She could only say the, the last words of other people's sentences. Mm -hmm. so, and, and then, but famously she falls in love with Narcissus who falls in love with his own reflection in the water. And he, he withers away to, um, and dies. And she, dies, she pines away as well. So it's only her voice is left. Mm -hmm. um, Kind of sad but beautiful in a way, no? Yeah, it is. Uh, it is yeah. So um, we're sort of wrapping up, and I have three questions for you. I do want to make sure to get to the questions. Okay. And them is what is the most challenging exhibition site or situation you've ever encountered? Hmm, that's a good one. I suppose the most, um, you could say, Regan's Kutz House, which was is this, this incredible museum in Bregenz in Austria. It was, the architect was is Peter Zumtor. It's beautiful. It's like, it has light streaming through all four floors of each of the identical floors of this building, but the acoustics are very, very challenging. And so you can hear a pin drop on the fourth floor from the bottom, from the ground floor. It's kind of like that. I never worked with such a, a long reverberation time, a long echo, you know, so I thought, okay, then I have to really make this work for me, make a work specifically for the the space for and use the um, acoustics. So, so in the end, I, I did. I, I made a, a huge installation throughout the entire building, four floors and a, a separate um, place outside in the cemetery, um, which was all synchronized together, the museum and the work in the cemetery. It was the fifth voice outside. And uh, so I suppose that was the, the most ambitious in terms of scale and, and, uh, and challenging acoustically. But then since then I've, done, I've worked, I've, I've realized what you can actually do with these acoustics, you know? And so then I did another work, which was also extremely challenging, which was ta the tanks in Tate Modern and the acoustics there, uh, that is the longest echo I've ever worked with. You know, you can hardly hear your voice because it echoes so much, you know, so I had to make a work. And I made a whispering gallery with the, the curvature of this, this space. It was originally a huge oil drum, this, the tanks and Tate Modern. And so I worked with the, because um, if it's curved, you can create a sort of whispering gallery, you know, a bit like in Grand Central Station or St. Paul's Cathedral, you know, the, the sound just travels around the, the space. You know, you might have experienced that phenomenon is it's it's quite quite amazing so I, d I created my own whispering gallery and 
in the tape. So yeah, so those those were very challenging spaces to work with. It looks like you negotiated with the challenge and you just made it sort of made you make something new and different. Yeah, and that's right. Space. That's right. It gave the work a whole new lease of life. It was a work that was in their collection and um, but it was never meant to be a whisp in a whispering gallery. But I, it, it, you know, it, it sort of was almost like made for that space, you know, so people were surprised that it, it had been actually made for a different space, you know. Mm -hmm. So my next question is, um, so you talk about the Elisa, Elizabethan era and known for melancholy, melancholy. Um, in COVID times, which is this enormous thing we've been living, do you have any thoughts on how that can be perceived later, but thinking now about it? Yeah, I think people are a lot more um, aware of, of um, I mean, when you're looking outside, I mean, it's, um, you become, uh, you know, like I was inspired to make a work that was, um, that by being enclosed in your domestic space, you know, so that was something, uh, looking at Edgar Allan Poe, it was a work for the um, Philadelphia Contemporary, and it was supposed to be in this mansion in the middle of a, a, yeah, another cemetery. And, uh, and he was from Philadelphia, Edgar Allan Poe, and I love his stories, but all his stories were written from, um, from his own home, you know, I mean, as, which isn't so surprising, but they were inspired by things from like up inside the fireplace or below the, underneath the floorboards or behind the wall, things immured and behind the wall like the cat or the, um, so the, the telltale heart was the one that really in, inspired the show where the sound came from underneath and from these, these spaces and so, but you know that, but in the end we couldn't do the show, but I did something that was um, a, um, a work that I made specially to be experienced online and, and people could download the sound on their, their smartphones and place the smartphone in objects that resonated, whether it was a vase or a pot or a pan. And so, uh, so that, that was definitely inspired by the lockdown, the situation in the lockdown and thinking, you know, those were the kind of spaces that inspired Edgar Allan Poe when he wrote those stories. So it, was, it did really resonate um, there, but it was also quite a fun project. And, you know, you could, you could have four or five different sounds from your, depending on who was in your household, you know. And you could play around with it in, in, in different rooms and stuff and call them responses. Yeah, so it was a lot more playful than it was intended to be in the, in the mansion in the cemetery, but uh, yeah. So I did play around with it, uh, with the sound. Oh, and did it. you? Yes, I did. I did. I did. <laughs> yeah. It was nice. very fun, I guess, but it was very personal. Um, is that still up? Is that something that people can access right now? Yeah, they can. Yeah, it's still up. It's called Muffled Drums. Muffled Drums, uh, Philadelphia Contemporary. Yeah. And they have, have a really nice website. Yeah, they have a um, Oh, right. Okay. Um, yeah, I can do that. Or you um, can just tell us and we'll put it up. Yeah, it's called um, Muffled Drums. Muffled. Um, Philadelphia Drums. Philadelphia Contemporary. And if you put that in, it will come right up. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we'll try to put it on the site so people can, um, it's still early here in Miami, we can play with that work at home um, and enjoy it a little bit and discover it. So my last question to you is, I have a third question. Have you ever worked with a symphony, a musician? And would you like to? Yes, I have. I worked with um, uh, a symphony in Pulitzer, uh, for the Pulitzer. And I, I made a work that was originally in Documenta, 
in the train station at Documenta. Uh, it was called Study for Strings, and it was a composition originally written by Pavel Haas, but I took this composition apart. I just uh, dismantled it and put it back together again, but with only two of the, the voices from the entire orchestra. Mm. So what you hear is something very different from the original composition that was written by Pavel Haas in, in the Theresienstadt concentration camp. So um, yeah, so what, what they did, the orchestra, they, they transcribed the, my work, which was just with the viola and the cello. And so the other voices of the orchestra, there were silences where those voices should have been. And so, they, so we transcribed that into music and they, they performed it without the other voices, the way I, the, the, I made it on the train tracks in Castle for Documenta. Wow. So that was wonderful. Yeah, wonderful for me to, 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 to um, I could only experience it online, but it, it was very well received and it, it sounded they did a really great job. Yeah, it was really nice. And for some people, it was the first encounter with Documenta, if they arrived by train. Yeah, so the, do the Documenta, it was, it was quite a different experience being outside on these train tracks and the sound was coming from a distance and, and those themes of distance and separation are kind of recurring themes in, in a lot of my works. And so, and, and so you stood at the platform's end and you heard these sounds, um, fragments from this study for strings and so you had the deep resonant resonant tones of the cello and then and, the, and then the viola and they sort of somehow merged with the other sounds of the, the trains and the um so i think that was all part of the experience of 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 that work you know you know you hear here from a distance you walk towards it or you you're waiting in anticipation so that's what I really like about working outdoors you know that you know that you have this um your 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 senses are more heightened when you're waiting for something or you have an, or it's unexpected you know beautiful well before we close again I would like to thank Art Bridges for the wonderful support of this program and Susan, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope everybody goes to the website and starts making sound. I hope you're inspired with, with Susan's work and um, you all make sound today. And um, Susan, I wanna invite you to Miami to come and see your work too, too much I once lamented at the Bass. It'll be there semi-permanently, or as permanent as we can possibly plan in this world. So oh, well, I would love to come, really. That would be wonderful. And it was really nice to be here today and to talk to you. So thank, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for your time. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Bye.